Uh, this is normally a filler slide, uh, but I think appropriately uh, it may be one of the most important slides uh, to support the comments that I have for you this afternoon. Uh, I was recently in Berlin speaking at TCG conference, which was extraordinary in its own way, and it struck me the amount of different cultures that were in the room, who, by the way, are all our customers. It also strikes you that between you know, age demographics, cultural differences, where we live in what part of the world or the, this country, um, it's an extraordinarily difficult thing to be able to have a CMO and a team communicate to a consumer, the ultimate value creator. And so I thought what I would do, and the only reason that they mentioned martial arts, is in martial arts there's, a, there's something you learn when you're, you receive your first black belt. And you think you've done something fantastic, you've studied hopefully for 15 to 20 years, and no matter what degree you are, um, the first thing you learn from your sensei is you are just a white belt of a different color. And that didn't feel good the first time I got my black belt when I was a young man. But I, and so what I would ask you to do, because I'm going to really share with you some difficult concepts this afternoon. Um, your black belts, think like a white belt. Drop what you know, but keep your, keep your learnings uh, running in the background of your mind. And maybe we'll get to a place that uh, protects brick and mortar and protects businesses in the future. So, uh, one of the ways that I think we can reach our customer in a common language, if, if it's so complex to communicate to the masses at an individual level, then maybe this concept of love and respect is something we should be focused on in retail. Maybe it's the reason that the consumer is going to get up off their butt and come to a luxury center and walk into a store, and so that your associates understand that it's a privilege to have a customer grace your doors. It's a privilege. I mean, a 75-year study for Harvard just came up. It said the most important thing in anybody's life, at the end of your life, is to have a meaningful relationship. And the number one thing that drives relationships is this concept of love that we all hold near and dear to our hearts. And so what does retail have to do with love and respect? Well, if you, if you listen to the news or you read, not much at this point. And like the media today, uh, it's very, very disconcerting because as you've seen today with the speakers that are in the room and what you know is going on in retail, these incredible bright minds of students that want to be in this space, the media is not doing us any help right now. I mean, right now, unprecedented store closings in 17 and probably 18 are nothing but a long liquidation process that's been going on for decades. And I would say that not necessarily the people here, but retail in general owes the consumer an apology. And if we, if we start to take a concept of what it really means to drive value with a customer, um, I would suggest that we start focusing on what's real instead of just opinions. So this may be a shocking statement to you, but it's really not transforming retail. I mean, we used to call it the internet. We used to actually call it showrooming, but I haven't heard that word today. So in the absence of certainty, right, and we heard from Sarah this morning, that when the absence of certainty occurs, commerce slows down, right? And what's happening right now is that in the absence of understanding what's really wrong with the brick and mortar experience, with, it, with that not clearly stated in anyone's mind, or, or on a piece of paper at least, is we, we pick something and we blame, we blame it. And what's happening right now is that the internet is not making this happen. It's, the shopper. In the absence of having a better opportunity, why would I go to a brick and mortar and be offended by the service level when I can sit at home and click 
and, 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 and purchase in a matter of seconds and, and have, have a sense of being that says that I'm, I'm in charge, I'm certain of my surroundings, and I have the ability to make a purchase on my own time. But if we, if we go back to the reason that people um, gather and the reason that brick and mortar exists, this is what concerns me. And, it, and it, if you think about it, how much conversation in the last year have you heard about the commitment to investment of the associate on the floor? How much do we really invest in the last three feet? So the billions of dollars that are expended on brand and that, and that effort is relegated to between 10 and 9, Monday through Saturday, and 11 to 7 on Sundays. And yet you can go on to Amazon 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know exactly what that experience is. You can get in, you can get out, and 99.9% .9 of the time, it works perfectly. And when it doesn't, they have a maniacal obsession with solving the issue and making you happy. And yet, brick and mortar has the hardest single job. It's the greatest challenge in retail. It's one of the hardest industries I've ever been in. And manufacturing, that's easy compared to the retail experience. So I would suggest that we should all worry about this and that we should think about how we're going to not give it lip service, but actually invest. So if you think subconsciously, the consumer, all of us, want to gather. We want to be with each other because if you didn't, you wouldn't have come here today. You wouldn't be at this conference. You'd be Skyping in <laughs> or multiple Skyping in. But we need human interaction. It's in our DNA. It's in our subconscious. It's something that we can't do, live without. It's why retail was invented, why it occurred in the first place. There were gatherings. There were markets. There were minstrels. There were people that came. And they shared ideas. And they passed on the news. And they saw things that they didn't know was possible. And this concept of why we exist actually um, sits in an in a, in a, in a education standpoint in brain science. So if you spent any time in this area, you would know that the human, us, has the need to have our status elevated. We need to be certain of our surroundings. We need to have the autonomy to choose how we buy. We need to relate to what's around us. And at the end of that day, that checks the fairness box. And that's what releases dopamine into our brain. And that is what creates a sense of joy. So while you were wearing for most of the day a beautiful scarf, I would gift you that acronym, S-C-A-R-F, Status, Certainty, Autonomy, Relatedness, and Fairness. But what do we measure? We measure a lot. Um, let me get a show of hands. How many of you have received data, information, reports, decks, and you've read it for your business? And over the weekend, you thought to yourself, that was interesting. But did I really learn anything from the data? Raise their hands. Be honest. Yeah, it's about 100% of the room. And what I don't want you to feel is that I'm against little data, big data, machine learning. Because coming from manufacturing and service businesses and retail, I know how important it is. But I also know that it can be a tremendous blinder to what's got to be viewed as the most important piece of data there is. And that's right here, is raising our customers' status in our stores. It's getting our associates to understand a very, what seemingly is an easy concept, but a difficult execution. And that is that when a customer decides to gift their time in our stores, that is the greatest gift. And it is our job to do one thing, and that's to make 
the time in that store, the best part of their day. It's not about selling something. It's not about creating the buy. It's about you have no idea what's going on in that person's life when they come into your store. They could have had phenomenal news. They could have suffered the death of a child. They may have a sick parent. And whatever that is, you have to find a way to instill a sense of care and comfort and love and respect so that your brand is held in a different place than just the concept of a recognized name and a product or service that the customer is predisposed to buy. So this intersection is very difficult today because of technology. And I think instead of starting with technology, let's go back to a fact. And that fact is we want to gather, we want to go to a center, you've got incredible developers in retail all over the world spending billions on resets right now to create environments. But retail has a responsibility to be a part of that environment and to make it connect so that the customer is learning, is dreaming, is playing and choosing in an elegant way. So if you break it down where the competitive point is to internet purchasing, and you start with experience, and I think this is a great quote, but really, in the end of, of, of the movie, product is going to clearly be just the experience. This gentleman, um, whom you all know, um, this was a great quote, and it wasn't really how the product looks, but it was how it works. Think, think about your iPhone, particularly when you don't have a cover on it. Right? It has a warmth to it. It has a tactile sensation to it. It has smooth edges. Its fit and finish is extraordinary. And how it works, it makes you more efficient. And for most of it, it's an anchor to reality today. We can't live without it. But what if those two things aren't enough? And what if design and experience won't sell the product? And what if Learning is a key component. In my, in my last six and a half years, I learned a lot about the consumer. And I learned that the consumer wants to know what's possible. They don't want endless choices, but they want to be able to come in and they want to be able to spend time dreaming about how to live a better life. They want to touch and feel and play with things. And they want to choose in a way, yes, that's efficient, therefore we created words like omnichannel. And all that's good. But, but the purpose of connecting with another human being and watching people around you in a store is the validation that, wow, that person's interested in what I'm interested in. And the conversation begins. And the fear is if we don't get this right, and that if technology and internet just drives the experience, the design, and the learning, then we're not going to be together. And here's what I can tell you. The number one, well, top five reason that the U.S. economy is the strongest economy in the world is simply because from the moment we get up in the morning, it's the velocity in which the dollar changes hands. And what I, my fear is, is if we stay home, that velocity is going to slow down because our purchasing is going to be very pointed and it is not going to be incidental. You won't be sitting at a coffee shop in a luxury center, and you won't see a pair of shoes which drives you to a store that passes the cosmetics and perfume counter where five, six, seven hundred, a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars <laughs> drops in that category. You see a belt, somebody walks you to another department. And, and that, is, that is the fear that I think everybody has, is how do we bridge these two worlds so that the consumer is continuing to explore and to be curious. So I will, I'll take you to a journey now. Um, some of you won't believe this, uh, but I will tell you that I watched it happen uh, over the last six years, and it, and it works 100% of the time. <laughs> so if you can get focused on, on joy and experience and design, you get to this place 
where your brand now is not a brand. It's not a recognized name. It's, it's about something completely different. And if we start with the first word, which is love, um, I think it's appropriate to think about how we fall in love in the first place. You recognize these brands? New Zealand All Blacks, Chicago Cubs, Apple, Disney. How many people are Cubs fans? A lot. For a long time, Robin, you didn't have a lot to cheer about, correct? Most of your life, all right. <laughs> What created this feeling of love and respect and almost beyond reason that you felt, or you still do, feel for the Cubs? And, it, and the people in the team in the stadium and the associates have that same feeling, right? They have that same feeling. When you go to Disney, how do you feel? Anybody? Don't be shy. Yeah, yeah. You have the sense of childhood that comes back, right? It's memories. You know, the original Disneyland opened in 1955, the year I was born. I went there. I went to Disneyland for 22 straight years. I don't know why I missed 23, but 22 straight years. And that feeling when I still walk in the park with uh, our godchildren now, uh, it's a subconscious thing. It wells up inside of you, right? And that's what world-class brands do. And it leads to a, a discussion, particularly with companies like Apple who are we're very, virtually very, very new, right? Um, started in 1976. First stores occurred in 2001. First two stores were at Tyson's and Glendale Galleria. And think what they did. They sat with developers and explained that I want to open up a computer store. That wasn't a good story in 2001. Does anybody remember CompUSA? Does anybody care that they're not here? Probably not. But what happened in 2001? That store opened, and people came in, and while there wasn't much of a, there was no iPhone, it was an iPod, right? And a funny looking shaped computer. But people dreamed, and they played, and they learned, and then they chose. And they broke the mold. No different than Tesla should be on this right now. No customer survey, let's be fair, would have ever said, hey, time to start a new car company, let alone electric, let alone cars that are electric, that are new, that cost over 100 grand. How many Tesla owners in the room? That was a really stupid question, Jeffrey. <laughs> one? I only have one. Well, then I'll tell you a story. I was an early adopter, imagine that. And I hate my car for several reasons. All the little things that shouldn't go wrong with a car on my car went wrong, including my friends. How many of you in this room have a car with electric windows where all four windows crashed into the bottom of the door frames independently of each other? How many people get in a car and their right rear door opens up? I don't mean pops open, I mean open six inches, right? But yet, I was in the heat of battle with my car driving to Rancho Mirage and I was going to speak at a Ritz-Carlton conference about cultural replication. Horrible word, but cultural replication. And I was pissed at my car. I got out, handed the keys to the valet, and this guy walks up to me and says, how do you like your car? And I said, I love my car. This is the greatest, <laughs> this is the greatest car I've ever had. So, so what causes us to even in pain with a brand, defend it? That's what we've got to get back to, right? When Carlos did his presentation today, uh, I'll 
Palacio. And you watch the videos and you watch the images and you listen to him. Give me a summary word how you felt. Louder. Passion. All right. What was it? Yep. Connected. Okay. I would give you, I would give you one that Stanley Marcus used, and in a book that he wrote, and he was right, is that retail should have a return to elegance. See, elegance doesn't mean expensive. It, it's how it makes you feel. It's what something looks like, feels like, smells like. There's an elegance to what I felt in, in their execution of a retail experience. And it made me want to go, it made me want to leave this room and go there. Right? Right? I mean, with Perch, I mean, let's just take and be fair with with appliance and plumbing. Those are two great words. And then the plumbing industry got even smarter and called it decorative plumbing. Like that was gonna make a difference. But I can guarantee you there has been very few times in those two industries history where a family got up and said, hey, let's go hang out in an appliance store. Right? So I'm gonna give you a graph. I have to have a graph or you'd be disappointed because we wanna measure stuff. So I'm going to give you two different quadrants, and the quadrants are the what we've been talking about, which is love and respect. And I'm going to suggest to you that this is the way the future of business is probably going to look. That yeah, we'll have commodity products, not, maybe not a lot of love, maybe not even a lot of respect, and, and fads are going to be in the lower right-hand side. And instead of brand, world-class brand being in the upper right, I think it's shifted to the left. And I think there's a transformation that's going to have to take place where world-class brands, online or not, brick and mortar or not, are going to have to transition to this concept of how do I connect with the customer in a way that gets Jeffrey to defend me when he was about ready to drive the car off a cliff, right? Because I can be perfectly straight with you. If I had had a Porsche, or a BMW, or an AMG Mercedes, and that shit was happening with those cars, I'd be invoking the Lemon Law in California at this point. I wouldn't have been defending it. And this is a hard place to be. So here's where you gotta ask yourself the question. Whatever business you have, or whatever business you work in, or whatever business you're leading or you own, if it didn't exist, would anybody care? Well, I believe that if Apple disappeared, and probably Tesla to some, only one or two in this room, that people would care. There's a lot of great brands. If it didn't exist, people would care. But nobody cares that Linen and Things isn't here anymore. And nobody cares um, about CompUSA. You said it. Uh, it it's, it's a, and think about one more thing. If you, if you think about the transition of tools for the savvy shopper, go way back. Sears had catalogs. You could buy homes from the catalog. And then amazingly, there was a Sears store. Think how that much to felt to the savvy shopper, right? When I was young, a little kid, five, six years old, my parents used to take me to department stores. And they were always downtown. And I'd have to get dressed up. I was in a little suit and tie. And I can remember sitting in the restaurant. And I remember these beautiful women, not when I was six. I now know they were beautiful women, walking up, elegantly dressed, spinning around and saying, you may find this on floor five in Couture. And then what happened? The developer created a mall. Maybe, maybe not tech savvy. But for the savvy shopper, that was a better way for us to use our time. So is really that a new concept that tech is changing retail? No, I think it's just a tool. And it intersected a point in retail where investment stopped in 08. There wasn't a lot of momentum. 
there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty in investment. And what I would suggest to you that the deferred maintenance that sits on many companies' balance sheets that prevents companies from reinventing themselves, maybe the deferred maintenance is the lack of investment in people and the human experience. So here's the first learning. If you're going to go down this path, because it takes guts, is you have to completely disrupt uh, the physical execution. And I picked this picture for one reason, uh, not only because of the company, but because that piece of real estate right there was the most underused, underdeveloped piece of real estate in New York. There was no store there. And it became one of the highest grossing stores in retail history. And I was there three, four weeks ago, and what did you see? It's barricaded <laughs> because they're closing it because it's too big. There's too much traffic. There's only one out and one in from a fire code perspective. And there's probably a million other reasons why they're doing it. But who takes a store of that size and barricades it? That takes guts. But that's this constant state of physical execution and the disruption of what people know to be true. Look what happened when, when you felt and you looked at um, Carlos's presentation, now how that stores and the vibrancy, the events, the gathering, the thought, the intensity that's required. And I wish he was here, he had to leave, but I have to tell you something, what he didn't talk about, and, I, and I, I, you gotta believe it's there, they have an amazing, they must have an amazing university or way to reach their people to deliver a message to a customer. Because you can't take and invest at that level what we saw today and not have that last three feet be absolutely in sync with absolute clarity and with perfection. You've got to create this sense of caring and, and comfort in the store. We talked about scarf. Look it up. It's real. Um, uh, back in 08, it was just a bunch of white papers, but it, but it caught my eye. And I searched out people that were experts at this. And you know, offering a customer a complimentary beverage. Welcome to our store, may I offer you a complimentary beverage? And while you're getting it, explaining how the store works, providing certainty to that person. Now I'm in charge. I have the autonomy to determine if I want to wander, if I want to be toured, or if I need, need to go immediately to choose and transact. I can relate to my surroundings. I would imagine that open malls don't exist in Mexico City because people are afraid of being kidnapped. And I would imagine beautiful department stores that feel secure is part of their strategy. Nothing against Mexico and what's going on down there, but the last time you were in an open air mall, I, you probably weren't worried about being grabbed off the street, right? Now that's a guess, but it's a possibility. And along the way, we got a surprise and delight constantly, and I think that's a theme that's gone away. And this doesn't have to be expensive stuff. This just can be wonderful things that you do for the customer. And, and you can't really plan it, so you have to invest in your associates, and you have to give them the power to do this. And again, that's another big step and another breakaway from processes and procedures, right? And we have to spend time on that. But we also have to spend time on the outcome. We have to engage the senses. And yes, we all pay attention, unfortunately, to four wall economics. But maybe this is the five walls right here of your filters every day that you judge the experience in your stores. Are you hitting on all five cylinders? Because if you're not, the customer will turn off. So while raising someone's status, creating certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness, clicks the button on dopamine and creates a sense of joy, let me tell you a different story. Has anybody ever gone home to their husband or their wife or their significant other and walked through the door and said, honey, I'm home, and all hell breaks loose? <laughs> let me see, a <laughs> let's raise some hands on that one, yeah. So what's happening there? Well, it's the opposite of scarf in a good way. 
that person's been scarfed. Somehow their status has been lowered. I walk into a store, no one even says hello to me. Subconsciously, my status has dropped tremendously. If I start to feel uncertain about my surroundings and how things work, I go to a deeper level. The same thing happens in a personal relationship. And what I can tell you in that, unfortunately, when dopamine gets released and you have a sense of joy, depending on your makeup physiologically, it lasts six to 15 minutes and it can be reaffirmed, re-injected. But if you go the other way, you come home and all hell breaks loose, that can last 15 minutes to two hours. Those are three different chemicals entering your brain. And that's got the same feeling of physical pain. And so you would be better off giving your husband, wife, or significant other four Advil and a glass of water and leaving for two and a half hours. Now, I wouldn't suggest that at that moment, but it's the truth because there's nothing you can do to change that chemistry in that person's body at that point. Now, if you have stores that engage like this, and the average time in those stores are an hour, hour and a half, two hours, then even someone that's in a bad place with your care and comfort can change their perspective. Now here's the hard part of making this execution. Um, and when I say hard, it, it takes commitment from the leadership of the company at an 80% level with your associates. It's a different way of thinking about clarity. So if you think about five buckets in a business, vision, strategy, operating excellence, business plan, and clarity, this is the hard part. It's the quest, right? We talked about, no, no survey said Tesla was needed. No survey said an iPhone was needed. Not at all. Nobody said Amazon Prime was needed. So what's going to happen in leadership going forward in any business, and particularly this industry, is what Terry said earlier today on stage. He says, there's no more room for incremental things. Retail's going to have to make some big bets. And you're going to have to use data, and you're going to have to use your black belt um, to inform, but you've got to have to have the decision speed to make that bet because I don't think brick and mortar has a decade to change. I think we're gonna pick up um, a, a doubling of the power of the choice through the internet that's frightening and it will affect different industries um, at different stages. Um, some will have a little bit longer, some will have a little bit less. And this is, this is kind of where we gotta live in a store. This is what your people have to be taught. So it's one thing to talk about a washer dryer, an oven, or a bathtub. It's another thing to teach your associates that it's not a bathtub. It's 45 minutes of sanctity or sanity for a working mother. And a, a washer and dryer is not that. It's the caretaker of your child's first blanket. And an oven is something that produces a chocolate chip cookie that smears a baby's face. And your grandmother takes a picture of it. And you have it in your wallet the rest of your life. And if you can get your people to talk about your products, your service, your experience, your design, and you can connect to a customer and understand that privilege and understand that that moment in their store, in your store is a gift, then you will traverse from a brand into this concept of love and respect. And that's what's gonna sustain companies. A while ago, nobody ever thought that Sears would ever go out of business. Can you imagine in the 60s, if Sears would have disappeared would anybody have cared? Of course they would have. Are they gonna care now? No. And that's how fleeting this concept is of a world-class brand and a sustainable business. I mean, in 2001, 
Apple was almost bankrupt. And look at the position that they hold in the world today, and they deserve it. But I bet you Mr. Cook gets up every day and instills in his people that that could disappear as quickly as it came to fruition. So this concept of human to human is not new. It's just hard to execute. And it takes commitment. And it has to, again, start with the leadership of the business, the very top. And that is a time commitment. It's not, yeah, I believe in this. It's I'm going to go deliver it almost store to store. Now, if you get to this point, what I have learned is that when you've released dopamine into somebody's brain, it's a tremendous responsibility. And the only way to get it right is your people have to understand it and truly want to serve. And it has to come from here. It has to come from your soul. Because if it's a script or a playbook, it's not real. And when you're dealing with subconscious and chemistry and human emotion and love, that can easily turn into manipulation and then that customer will hate you for the rest of your life. So what I would ask you to think about is this fierce commitment to deliver a culture in the future that's sustainable and has a message that's felt, that's simple, that they clearly understand Treat your people 1% to 2% better than you treat your customer. Because if you don't, they don't know what it feels like. And they don't know how to deliver it. And that leads to a story. Um, I wrote down on a piece of paper in the last business I was involved with, um, Jerry asked me, what would be the greatest single compliment that anyone could give you um, in this appliance and plumbing business. And I thought about it, and I said, you know what would be cool is if I was standing in a store and a woman came up to me and said, I understand you were partly responsible for this. And she said, I want to let you know that you talked me into putting a wood stone hearth in my kitchen. And my daughters were 9, 11, and 14. And that one thing caused me to have Friday nights with them. Every Friday night, they didn't want to go anyplace else. They invited their friends over, and we made pizzas together. And now they're off to college. And it changed our family unit. And that didn't happen, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> I really wanted that to happen. I had, it, <laughs> I had it all thought out one day. But I want to tell you, uh, in closing, what did happen. I was in a store a year and a half ago, and I, had a, I was talking to uh, an individual in the front of the store, and out of the corner of my eye, there was a woman that got up from the barista bar. She's all dressed in white, maybe in her late 60s, early 70s beautiful white um, hair. And she walked up in front of the store and she interrupted the conversation and she started rubbing the top of my head. <laughs> and that was uncomfortable at, at, at that moment. See how far we've transgressed from the story, but no. <laughs> so, <clears throat> And when she did that, she put her hands on my outside of my shoulders and she says, I want to let you know that I, I looked just like you two years ago. And I live on Noble Drive in San Diego, which is about a mile from this Westfield property. And I didn't feel like I could go out in public. And I didn't want to go out in public. And I didn't want to engage. But the people in this store made me feel welcome. And I came in here and I drank some weak tea and every once in a while, uh, the chefs would make something for me. And I want you to know I've never bought a thing from you, not even a bar of soap. 
But what you need to know is you're responsible in part for my health, this place, because I'm in full remission right now. And so whatever you do, make sure you protect whatever you created. Whatever you do, make sure you protect this feeling that your people can actually give another human being. Because if you do, then we don't have to worry about much because humanity is going to be the new luxury. Thanks, that's all I've got.